Okay. Uh, so I have been asked to give you guys a survey of different kind of lasers. Right, so if you have questions, ask me because I have no idea what you guys already know. Uh, generally, I don't allow laptops or wireless things on my class. So if you guys have laptop open or wireless something, you can shut it down, please. Okay, so here's the world's smallest laser. Okay, uh, it's a record right now. Uh, it's something that was uh, designed, proposed at Cornell. Uh, this is an example of a semiconductor laser that you might or might not do in some of the subsequent lectures, but that's a plasmonic laser. That's the laser that is going to come next. Okay, but just wanted to show you how small laser can be. The size scale over here is 100 nanometer. Okay, so that's the smallest size scale. But today we're going to discuss some of the bigger devices. Now, before we do that, uh, there's something that is almost always shown. And that's the different energy level configuration used for lasers. All right. Uh, these first two are the three level schemes. And the third one is a four level scheme. So the dark arrow that you are seeing over here, uh, that's the optical transition. That's the way the lasing transition actually happens. That's where you get population version and gain. Okay. Everything else is uh, uh, the non lasing transitions. So for example, in this scheme, uh, what you do is that the atoms are sitting all in the ground state over here. Uh, you pump them by some means into the third state over there. And in this third state, they quickly relax down to the second state. And when they pile up on a second state, and if they are more in a second state than in a ground state over here, you get population inversion and therefore lazy. In this scheme over here, uh, atoms are sitting over here, you somehow pump them into the second state on top. And from there, uh, they optically transition into this one state over here and from there quickly relax back. Now if you look at this scheme, uh, there are certain advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is it's a simple scheme. The disadvantage is that supposing you have a certain number of atoms in the ground state to begin with, say 100. Okay? 100 is a small number, I'm just making it up. To get population version, you need at least as many atoms in the ground state as at the bottom. That's essentially right at the threshold of population version, okay? or transparency as it's called. If you assume for a moment that whatever atom you put in the third state is going to come immediately down from three to two, and that's a very fast transition. By some relaxation, give the energy off to maybe four nodes or something else. So whatever you go put over here will immediately come down. That means if you had 100 atoms starting in the ground state, you have to put at least 50 in this upper level before you get transparency. Okay? And if you put more than 50 on top, that means less than 50 are sitting at the bottom, then you will get, start getting gain. All right, so let's look at this scheme. Here, you have to pump the electrons all the way on the, on the second stage. But there's a tremendous advantage in the second scheme compared to the first one. Okay? And that is that once the atom make an optical transition down over here, this rate is pretty fast. So the bottom level is almost always empty. Okay? So what's the advantage of the second scheme compared to the first one? Yes. You have, to pump it less. you have to pump it less because if you wouldn't put few atoms on top, uh, that's more than the atom sitting on the lower level, the lower lasing level, and therefore it's very easy to get transparency and population version. Okay. What's the disadvantage? Seems to be better than the first scheme in all aspects. What's the bad thing? Why wouldn't you want to use it?
Supposing you decide to pump really hard, okay? Your pump is taking the atom from here and putting it on the two level. But the pump, by stimulated excitation or de-excitation, can do the opposite too. Okay? It can actually take an atom from there, second level, and bring it down back to zero by stimulated emission. If it can go up, it can come down too. Okay? So essentially you're pumping into the second level, but you're also emptying it out with your pump too. Not a very good scheme. Inefficient. Why that doesn't happen in this scheme? Because as soon as you pump something up there, it immediately goes to the two level, and there's nothing really left in the top level to come down by the pump. Okay? So there's advantages and disadvantages in both the schemes. So you say, okay, let's combine the best of both the parts and come up with this four level scheme. Where you start with some atoms over here, pump them to the third level, they immediately relax to the second level. And hopefully you have designed things in your material that this fast relaxation does indeed happen. And so the atoms pile up over here and the lasing transition is between two and one. And as soon as the atoms come down to this state, they again relax very fast down to zero. Okay. So that means three remains empty mostly, and one remains empty mostly, and that's exactly what you want. Okay. You wanted uh, this level to be almost empty and this level to be almost empty. And you can pump, and you can pump really efficiently, so all the things that you wanted to do are possible. So this four level scheme is one of the most efficient ones. Of course, these four levels are not exactly present like this in any real medium. What you end up happening, or what you end up having, is that you have a whole bunch of levels on top, instead of just this two level, and there's a whole bunch of levels, this one all the way down over here, Okay, and this three could be a separate level or it could be part of this two level by itself. So there's always this band of levels on top and this band of levels at the bottom. Okay, So you can sort of implement the four level scheme by using the different levels on top and bottom as long as the rates that you want to be fast are fast enough. Okay. Now, if you are trying to make a laser, the thing that you're worried about normally is if you are sitting in thermal equilibrium, especially for example this kind of system over here, what's the probability of the atoms being in thermal equilibrium in being in zero state or one state? So that probability is given by the Boltzmann factors. Okay, so the probability of being in the k level and the jth level is in the ratio of their energies e power minus energy divided by kt. All right. Now, typically when you say this level is one, uh, it's not always a single level. Uh, there could be many quantum mechanical states at the same energy called one. Okay. So how many quantum mechanical levels do you have and that is indicated by this quantity g so if I multiply the number of levels by the probability of occupation, so G times P, then I get the actual number of atoms present in that state. Okay? So if I multiply both top and bottom by G, I get the total number of atoms present in that state. So the ratio of the atoms is the same Boltzmann factors, but these G, which are the number of quantum levels at that energy, which is also called the degeneracy of the level, also come in there. Now these factors are problematic, especially in this case over here, because what they mean is, imagine you're trying to make a laser and these one and zero were close together. So if you're sitting in thermal equilibrium, then this one level is not exactly empty. There is thermal excitation of atoms from the ground state into this one state. Okay. 
And if these levels are very close, the ratio of these occupations would be in the ratio of these energy exponentials. So if kT, if this temperature kT is really small, you know, let's say you're working at liquid helium or liquid nitrogen, uh, then you're okay, maybe the upper level is not thermally occupied. But if you are working at really high temperature and lasers get really, really hot, they get so hot that you have this water coolant running all around the crystals. Uh, then there could be a sufficient population sitting in one level in equilibrium, which means if you try to pump atoms from the zero state into the two state, it's not that this one level is going to be sitting empty, there will be a lot of filling already taking place. Right. So this backfilling of atoms is a problem. And so you want sufficient separation on this side uh, to make sure that this thing doesn't happen. Okay. Second thing, uh, you want these transitions 3 to 2 and 1 to 0 to be very fast. And typically you don't have this situation, you have this situation where these levels are a bunch of levels clustered together. And that essentially means that this relaxation uh, for example, from 1 to 0, is actually a multi-step process where they sort of jump from level to level to level until they go down. And you want all these things to be pretty fast, so these things can happen. So while we discuss different lasers in the next few slides, you can refer back to this diagram over here and tell me if it's for a three-level or a four-level system or maybe more like this one. All right. Okay, have you guys done examples of any real laser so far in the course? No? Okay, so this is the... Uh, you probably get the first introduction over here. Alright, so the first laser is this ruby laser. Okay. Uh, one of the first lasers to be demonstrated. Uh, demonstrated well. So essentially the idea is that you start with this sapphire crystal. Sapphire crystal, if it's pure sapphire, it will be almost transparent. Okay. But you dope it with chromium. And essentially the way you make it is you start with this aluminum oxide melt when you're growing it and you add some chromium oxide into it so that by the time everything mix becomes a crystal, some of these aluminum atoms are replaced by chromium atoms. So it's the chromium atom where all the action is happening. Uh, aluminum is just the matrix. Okay. <coughs> and so the way you would pop this is you will have this some kind of a very strong, essentially a, a flashlight. Okay. So it's an incandescent or something, a flash tube or something, which is providing a thermal light, very high temperature, really hot, uh, enough to put electrons from the lower level to some higher level. Okay. And once these chromium atoms sitting in there uh, emit light, you don't let the light escape. You make this little cavity, which is somehow made from the ruby crystal itself. So you take the end facets of these ruby crystals and make them polished and put maybe some kind of lens over there on both sides. And so all the light that gets emitted doesn't really escape the cavity. It remains inside the cavity, bouncing back and forth uh, uh, and getting amplified by a stimulated emission. Uh, the photons are multiplying by a stimulated emission uh, till the light inside builds up to really large levels. That's in some vague sense we call lasing and it comes out from this side facet. Right? And this flash tube typically uh, is not sitting next to it, it's wound around the ruby crystal as shown over here to make the cup coupling more efficient. Okay. So the essential idea is that you dope the host matrix by the proper amount of impurity ions, in this case chromium. So if you look at the energy levels of chromium, uh, that's how they look like. Okay. These are these strange units which are per inverse centimeter. Okay, these are energy units. So per centimeter essentially one upon wavelength, free space wavelength. 
So 10,000 word centimeter is about one micron. Okay. 20,000 word centimeter would be 500 nanometer, half a micron. Okay. And 1,000 word centimeter would be 10 micron. So if you look at this energy level scheme, uh, the energy levels here, the energy levels here, this is the ground energy level, and this is the lasing transition. What level scheme is this? Four level, three level? Which one does it correspond to? That's an easy question. Okay, let me show you this again. This one? And this one. Still not? Somebody? Yes. Is it A? Okay. So you have two levels on top, and then you have the ground strike. So you have this energy level over here, and this energy level over here, and these energy level, which is the lasing one. So the idea is you can do two things. You can either excite the atoms into the upper state from the ground state over here by using a green light in which case the atoms will sort of go over here and then they will immediately go down on this level and this is your lasing transition that's one way to do it the other way to do that is to use blue light excite the atoms into this level and then they come down again here and this is the lasing transition both ways uh, whether you use the green level on top or the blue level on top, it's a three-level system corresponding to the figure A. Now, more interestingly, if you zoom in on here, you will see that it's not just one level. It's actually uh, these two different energy levels, okay, uh, very close together. So sometimes when we draw these diagrams and we have one energy level, it could be a cluster, it could be some closely spaced levels. And so this transition, ballpark, is 1.79 eV. Or 1.8 eV. One point eight eV is about red in color. Okay. So that's why the lasing sort of looks red. So this was the first laser uh, that was demonstrated and it was a nice device because at that point we didn't have other laser sources so that was sort of the, one of the first ones to be made and so the only way to excite the atom in the upper state was to use a thermal light source okay a flash tube uh, and that actually worked but the problem with the flash tube is essentially white light and white light have all the wavelengths in it. Okay, so if you excite white light, uh, you will excite green and you excite blue, all of it. Okay, you will send basically using all the both the levels on top to excite the atoms on on green and blue, and then they will come back down over here. So at some point you should be asking, well, why doesn't that white light excite this level directly too? It can because that transition is optically active, meaning if it can emit light, it can absorb light too. Okay, and white light has all the wavelengths, so it has red too, and red can excite the atom in this, it's possible. But it turns out that these blue and green are such efficient absorbing transitions with a very large cross-section that pretty much all the light that you shine on it goes into the green and blue. Okay? So it becomes a very efficient pumping scheme, putting atoms on the top, and they come down over here. Okay, here's another laser. This is the energy level structure of what is called neodymium JAG, okay, or typically called ND JAG. Now it turns out that this laser uh, is belongs to a class of lasers which I'm calling the rare earth dope lasers. So what you do is you take this rare earth metal. It could be erbium, uh, yttrium, uh, ytterbium, neod neod uh, yeah, neodymium, 
a uh, couple of others, and you put them in a host matrix. Then a host matrix could be sapphire, it could be jag, which is actually yttrium aluminum garnet, just happens to be a nice good crystal with a good thermal conductivity. Okay. It could be silica. Right. So you put these atoms in some host lattice and the nice thing about these atoms is that they have these nice energy levels and then the trick is to start using some of them to make lasing happen. Now it turns out this ND JAG, uh, the lasing transition is 1064 nanometer which means shown by this arrow. This is 1064. Okay. Right from here to there. And typically, the way you pump it, you pump it with 808 nanometer. This is 808 nanometer. So you pump it all the way from here up there. Then these atoms relax down here. Then there's a lasing transition from there to there. And then the atoms relax back down to this level. So, which one of these things that corresponds to? C, C or a little bit of D. Okay. All right. Now, but there's one thing: you don't using a flash lamp anymore. Okay. Because by the time people made ND Yang lasers, they already have other lasers going at the same time, in particular semiconductor lasers. Okay. And it turns out semiconductors you can get easily at 8 to 8 nanometer, so that's the one you use to pump it. Okay. So you can pump it all the way over there, and it sort of comes down back over there. And the way you make a laser is pretty simple. You take this ND JAG crystal over here, and then you take your big powerful semiconductor diode lasers, which are sitting at 8 to 8 nanometer, and you focus them right into this JAG crystal. And of course, this Jack crystal sends out light at 1064 in all directions. The one which is in the direction of the cavity goes over here, goes over here, and then keeps going round and round till it gets amplified. And then finally comes out from one side. Okay? So these are an example of a semiconductor pumped solid state laser. It's solid state because you're using this solid state piece of ND Jack and it's pumped by, not by a flashlight, but by a semiconductor laser. So ND JAG emits at 1064. 1064 is near IR, you can't really see it with your eye. Okay. That laser shown over here is an ND JAG, but what you see coming out is green. Okay. So typical, most typical application of ND JAG is that ND JAG produces 1064, before the laser actually comes out of the cavity, the frequency up converted by an optical nonlinearity, so double the frequency. So the 1064 becomes 532. And 532 is green. Okay? So it's a green laser. Inside it, a semiconductor laser which pumps the ND YAG, and the output of the ND YAG laser is frequency doubled to give you the green light. Very powerful, very strong. Uh, green lasers you can make. In fact, some of the, from the highest power uh, green lasers are this ND Yang lasers. Okay. Sort of a workhorse. All right. Now, the laser, or the thing that really changed the way we conduct business today. Okay. Uh, so, if you write the history of communications, the one device that made all the difference. It wasn't any communication device, it wasn't anything else. The thing that really changed everything was this thing. Erbium dope fiber amplifier. Okay. And what was that was that if you want to send signal via an optical fiber from one place to the other, uh, it was not possible to do that because fibers these glass fibers tend to be pretty lossy. I mean, you can send a signal from Ithaca to downtown, maybe from Cornell, 
uh, maybe you'll make it to Almira, but that's about it. Okay, you can send a signal from here to California. So the thing that changed that made the difference and it made communication possible from US to Europe, transatlantic and transpacific, was the fact that somebody discovered that you can take a piece of optical fiber itself. Okay, so here's a little piece of optical fiber. And you can embed these rare earth ions, not in some other host matrix, but in the fiber itself. And so you take a piece of fiber and turn it into an optical amplifier. So as the signal goes from one end of the fiber from some laser, it goes down the fiber, and maybe that fiber over here is from here to, I don't know, New York City. Okay. Signal is way down by then, but as it's going through the fiber, a little piece of fiber is turned into an amplifier, and then when it signal gets again regenerated, amplified, and then it travels the next distance, and then maybe there's another fiber amplifier. And you can put as many as you like, uh, and they're just sitting there, and they're just acting like amplifiers. That literally changed the way fiber optic industry was before the fiber amplifier and after the fiber amplifier. And certainly fiber amplifier was the technology of choice, down with all the cables and copper and everything. And that was the revolution. That was late 80s. Okay. So there's one device that changed everything. Uh, in communication, that was the fiber amplifier. Okay. And it just came at the right time. And the way you make this fiber amplifier work is, uh, it's an amplifier, that means it has to have population version and gain and everything. Uh, you use a semiconductor diode laser at around 980, and that goes in here, light, and it pumps the RBM atoms uh, to provide enough gain at the fiber optic communication wavelength, which is typically 1.55 or close to 1.55. Right? So if you look at this RBM dope fiber, so essentially you have a piece of glass in which you have embedded these RBM atoms, that's how it looks like. You've got this ground state and a whole bunch of energy levels over here, which if you look closely, you'll see a bunch of levels. There's another band of levels, and this is another band of levels. And when, conveniently, it turns out that from here to there, this transition is 1550, or close to 1550. Now that's amazing, because 1550 happened to be the exact wavelength in which the earlier fibers, meaning the ones used in 1990s and 2000s, had the minimum loss. There were two wavelengths in which the fiber had minimum loss. It was 1300 and it was 1550. And so now you have an atom with the transition sitting right at 1550, which is exactly where you want to communicate. So you can amplify your communication signals. And the way this RBM dope fiber amplifier works is you use 980 diode pump laser and you take the atoms and put them from this state all the way to that state. And from there they come down and from here, they make a transition down straight below. So it's essentially a three-level system, okay? With the exception that all of these levels are actually multiple levels. Okay. So the three-level system is never really exactly pure three because every energy level is a cluster of energy levels. Okay. So if you want to make a fiber laser, it's really simple. It's one of the easiest lasers to make in about maybe three hours in the lab. Okay. And the way it works is you take a piece of RBM dope fiber, which you can buy from the, you know, for maybe 100 bucks from commercial industry. And then you take that fiber and connect it to a regular fiber. So the green part is the one with RBM atoms embedded in the glass. And then you take a regular fiber piece, okay? And somewhere over here, you have this 980 nanometer semiconductor laser, which is the pump laser, and also a couple light in. So this 980 light comes in, it gets coupled in into the fiber, it goes round, and then gets completely depleted in the amplifier because all the energy is absorbed into putting the RBM atoms in the upper state. Okay. 
Now, when the beam atoms come down over here and then come down from here, they emit light at 1550. That 1550 light in the erbium fiber uh, goes around and keeps going around in circles. The output, instead of being taken out of a mirror, is actually tapped out by this coupler over here. So that coupler maybe passes 10% or 30% of the light out, and the rest it keeps it within the cavity, within that little fiber loop. Okay. So that's sort of a mirrorless laser cavity where the laser cavity is essentially a five piece of fiber where the light goes round and round and you tap it out from one side. And if you don't really want your light to actually start going in the opposite direction too, which will be a bad thing, uh, you put an optical isolator. These optical isolators are pretty amazing things. They d let light pass one direction, but don't let light pass the other direction. Do you guys see some problem with that? that light can pass one way but not the other way? Am I breaking some notion? Electromagnetic wave equations are typically have time reversal symmetry. That means if propagation in one direction is possible, the propagation in the opposite direction is also possible. If you let t goes to minus t in Maxwell equations, you get the same equations, meaning if forward propagation can happen, so can backward. If you reverse the movie, it still satisfies Maxwell equation. So how does an optical isolator work? Yes? It just uses the wave particle No. You have to break the time reversal symmetry somehow of Maxwell equation. And the way you do it is apply a magnetic field, DC magnetic field. So a DC magnetic field breaks time reversal symmetry. So inside the optical isolator, there's a big magnetic field. So that breaks the time reversal symmetry. Uh, so light can go one way, but not the other way. Okay. Really useful device in many optical uh, systems. Okay. Now, if you look at if you look at the emission absorption spectrum of erbium. So take a piece of RBM and try to see at which wavelength does it absorb. You will get this blue curve around 1550. It's not one line of absorption that you get, and you're getting this big giant wavelength band over which RBM is absorbing. And then you see, okay, let me see, look at the light coming out of this RBM and see if it's at the energy level that I thought. And to your pleasure or to your horror, you will figure out that this emitted photons also have this big giant bandwidth shown by red. You get everything around 1550, not one single line. And what's happening is if you go back to your energy level diagram, the upper level around 1550 is not just one level. Okay, There's a whole bunch of levels. Uh, and so the light that you get is composed of 1550 photons are all different wavelengths. So imagine that you get population merged in this device. Okay? That means you take items out over here and put in all these levels sitting on top. That means you have population version and gain not just in two precisely defined energy levels, but over a much bigger bandwidth. Okay? So, in other words, light can come out within this bandwidth, which is shown by red. So, most likely your gain is also in the same big bandwidth as the photons coming out. Yes. So, the question is, is it, is it bad uh, that your atoms are not piling up in a single level and give you giant population version in that level, as opposed to those atoms getting divided into maybe 10 different levels? Turns out it's a big blessing in disguise because in optical fiber communication, you use this entire bandwidth. Okay? When you send signals down in optical fiber, you basically do what's called wavelength division multiplexing. You send your signal over different wavelengths to utilize the entire capacity of the optical fiber. And of course, the RBM fiber amplifier doesn't know which wavelength is coming in. 
but because it provides population version and gain at this broad enough spectrum, then essentially means that it can amplify all the signals that are coming through it. So, okay, so you can use that entire bandwidth from here to there, which is 100 nanometer bandwidth. 100 nanometer bandwidth is pretty amazing. Uh, that means you can have enormous communication data rate if you send different wavelengths in that whole range and can get them all amplified uh, at the same time without worrying about anything. Okay. So the fact that LBM drop amplifier has this bandwidth is a giant blessing. Uh, if it only was sitting at 1551 level, it would not have been useful at all. Okay. So now people can do these WDM wavelengths you guys, anybody know how many different wavelength channels they have piled up in this range? It used to be about 64 different wavelengths in late 90s when I started graduate school. They're sitting about 512 right now. Okay. Uh, so basically, putting a wavelength channel every 25 gigahertz in frequency in that whole 100 nanometer range. There's an enormous amount of capacity in the fiber. Plus on top of that, they have now started making fibers that just doesn't have this lossless region around 1550. It is lossless all the way from 1.2 micron to 1.7 micron. Okay. That's a 500 nanometer bandwidth that is ready to be utilized. Okay, I'm out of time. So let's do one more laser, titanium sapphire. Really popular laser. It's the workhorse in every lab. How many of you have seen a titanium sapphire? No, just one, two, three, okay. So titanium sapphire, you take the titanium mine and you put it in a sapphire crystal, aluminum oxide. It gives it the red color. And inside, the energy level looks like this. It looks like a horrible mess. A whole bunch of energy levels down there and a whole bunch of energy levels on top. Uh, and so when you take an atom, put it in the upper state, it sort of goes down to the edge and then comes down somewhere. Now, it can come down from there to there. It can come down from here. It can come down here. It can come down where this big arrow is. It can come down anyways. And that turns out to be a big blessing also because the same laser, depending upon how exactly you make your cavity, it can laser anywhere from 650 all the way till 1050 nanometer. Okay, you can get population uh, inversion in any one of those things. And if and you guys probably have done already mode lock lasers or not? You've done it. So for mode locking, you need a gain bandwidth, which is pretty large, so they have all these longitudinal modes that can get mode locked. So Titan Sapphire can have these longitudinal modes in the entire bandwidth from 650 to, to uh, 10 or even larger. They have such a big bandwidth that the resulting optical pulse is enormously narrow by inverse Fourier transformation. It's so narrow that essentially only a single or a few cycle optical pulse. Okay. So that makes this Titan Sapphire so enormously useful because it can generate optical pulses that are essentially half a cycle, the record, or a single cycle. Okay. Because the gain bandwidth is so big. And uh, If you look inside the Titan Sapphire, uh, you will see that this is, over here, is where the Titanium Sapphire Crystal is. Okay, it's a reddish crystal, and it's this green that you see is actually the pump laser. So it's typically pumped around 532, green light. And so this transition is typically green, the pumping one. And so the green light comes in, bounces around, and hits the Titan Sapphire. And what you see is reddish. Uh, the actual titanium sapphire might be more like 900, 800 is the sweet spot. 
but you can't really see 800. What you see is the res residual fluorescence, which is in the tail of the spectrum around red. Okay, and it's sort of, and so this is much, much, much less power. So one common mistake students make is they look at the red light and say, "Oh, this is not bright enough. My eyes will be fine." What they don't realize is that what the red thing that they're seeing is only the tail of the spectrum. The real power is sitting at 800 that you cannot see, which is all going in your eye. Okay. So that's the danger of these devices, which the fluorescence can be pretty weak, and you might think it's a very weak signal. There's what you're not seeing is the really the strong strength rise right there. All right. So I will just stop here because we are running over time. So. Uh, Professor Jenna will continue next time.